Through COVID, we learned that uh, there are invisible strings that are connecting all of us. And uh, when, um, when uh, we are infected with the virus, it's uh, something that, uh, that, can, um, that, that is spreading through our social networks and the way how they are created. And it doesn't matter if you are rich, if your uh, family living next door is poor, then, then the system is weak. And this invisible design that we are not taking under consideration, but that is there as a part of our natural habitat, is actually something what, um, what we need to address. We started the Terme Art Program uh, to work with artists to address questions of architecture already in 2017 because we saw that artists actually understand a much more complex reality than, um, than often architects and designers. And when they work together, then um, a magic can happen. Magic that, um, that uh, is now represented here um, on the stage, and I'm extremely thankful for you all to be here. Um, uh, for the panel from Breaking Bauhaus, this was the panel we just finalized, to Growing Gaia, this is the panel that we are starting right now. James Lovelock uh, and Lynn Margulis um, said that the environment and the atmosphere of the planet is not just our environment, it's not just something that makes life possible. It's the life itself. We are connected for life and when you zoom out of the planet, then um, we see the planet as a cohabitat, as a symbiosis, as something that we can describe as a living organism. So if this is true, this hypothesis, uh, then it means that every time we design something, we are not really creating something new, but we are actually um, transforming existing design into something new. And when we now look into our cities, very often we see that this transformation is actually a destruction, a destruction of living connections, a destruction of resilience, uh, destruction of anti-fragility that is extremely necessary for us to survive as a species. Before we start you know, talking about uh, the big issues of our environmental situation uh, like climate change, uh, we probably have to address issues that are um, affecting us uh, as populations and as uh, a species already now. And this is the way how we live and how we organize uh, our lives uh, together. Um, empathy is a very big uh, part of it. Uh, it's also a biological uh, moment and it's something that, uh, that Lynn Margulis uh, was describing uh, in many different ways. Um, I'm very happy that um, Salome Rodek, she is uh, a cultural scientist that is actually working uh, about Lynn Margulis. Lynn Margulis is maybe the most underrated scientist uh, ever. Because, uh, probably because she was a woman, but also because um, she was one against all the neo-Darwinists. And, uh, and her theory was so right that it became mainstream without giving her the real credits. So Salome's um, uh, role on the stage will be to give her these credits and to show us uh, the perspective of Lynn Margulis on design and on our world. And without Lynn Margulis, James Lovelock wouldn't have come up with the theory of Gaia. When, as a NASA scientist, he was planning the first Mars mission of NASA, uh, his uh, question that he was asking himself was how Mars could become livable. And with this question, he looked back. Going already in his thoughts to Mars, he looked back uh, on the planet Earth and he asked himself this question and then he saw that the planet probably is much more than just our environment, it's probably a living organism and Hans Ulrich uh, that, um, uh, that did the interview with James Lovelock that we will bring back here on the screens uh, is with us now um, and I'm very thankful to you Hans Ulrich that you are the mentor of our program and uh, and that uh, you are now here continuing what we started with the session of Breaking Bauhaus. And uh, I would like to give the word to you so you can introduce uh, uh, the other panelists on this panel and um, then uh, start with a keynote uh, to guide us into this session of Growing Gaia. Thank you very much and thank you everybody for being here.
Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Nikolai, and thanks to all of you, uh, indeed, for being here. Um, and I would say maybe um, uh, we should give a very warm welcome and big round of applause to our amazing speakers who are with us, because as the previous panel, actually, it is a very hybrid panel, because it is a panel where we're going to basically have uh, live presentations with the wonderful panelists who are here with us, but we're also going to have special guests on the screen. Um, it is a new typology, I would say, of panel, which uh, uh, at the current moment is being born. It has not existed before. It was fascinating uh, earlier today on the Bauhaus panel to see, to see that. Uh, and so the speakers this afternoon are Francis Carey, Thomas Saraceno, Stefano Mancusa via, via Scream, Salome Rodek, uh, Aslim Margulis, um, and uh, James Lovelock on a video clip, Abuelo Antonio Oxte via Stream, Lucia Pietro Justi, Egil Serbjonsen to a Greenford. Uh, please give them a very warm welcome, a big round of applause. And I just want to say a few words as, as introduction. As uh, Nikolai said, we're going to show fragments this afternoon also from my interview with uh, James Lovelock. And uh, the Gaia hypothesis uh, was proposed by Margulis and Lovelock and developed really in the 70s. And we are so lucky to have Salome here, who is uh, going to tell us much, much more about Lim Margulis, one of the most important uh, thinkers really, uh, much more than a scientist, because Lim Margulis is a scientist, but also a f you know, philosophically so important. And uh, I became aware of that when I was a student because I met the late Francesco Varela. He was a Chilean scientist who worked with uh, Maturana in Chile, uh, uh, was basically you know, close to Allende, and when then uh, the dictatorship uh, of Pinochet started, he had to go to exile first to the United States and later to Paris. And I was at the time a curator at the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris and uh, uh, befriended Varela and we would always hang out. And he was really the first one because as Nicolas said, you know, uh, still today but even less than, you know, Lynn Margulis had, had the visibility or has the visibility she deserves as one of the great figures of the 20, and I would say particularly the 21st century. Um, and so Varela would always tell me to, you know, to read Lynn, uh, Lynn Margulis. Now what is so, so important, uh, I would say, about this, um, about, this Gaia, about this Gaia idea is that it's of course so central today um, for ecology. Uh, and it's interesting that actually when um, asked shortly before her passing in 2011 by a journalist whether she ever is being tired of being controversial, Magulis replied, I don't consider my ideas controversial, I consider them right. And that of course exactly, uh, we're going to hear more from you about that, uh, is what is the case because more and more these ideas which were so rejected by science, you know, gained, gained momentum and are today really at the center of the discourse. Now Lovelock was trained from the medical side in bacteriology and he actually tended to think of bacteria as pathogens and it did not occur to him that uh, there is a great infrastructure that keeps the earth going. When I interviewed him uh, and uh, I think he's now 101 when I went to see him in Chesil Beach uh, he was 99 and it was interesting because of course Bruno Latour as many of you I'm sure read has written a whole book on the idea of, uh, uh, of Gaia, and I rang Latour and I said, you know, I have this rendezvous with James Lovelock, and Latour said, you know, most likely uh, he's 99, this is going to be very difficult, but uh, he gave me some questions anyhow, and it wasn't actually difficult at all, because I found a James Lovelock in greatest form, uh, who gave me a four-hour, you know, interview, and he really told me that he had not understood this importance of this infrastructure. He, he just thought of bacteria as pathogens. And, the, and he said, you know, it was really Lin who dro drove that idea home. Margulis understood that contrary to so many interpretations, the Gaia hypothesis was not the vision of the Earth as a single organism, but as a jungle of interlacing and overlying entities, each of which generates their own environment. Now, Lovelock and Margulis have tried to persuade humans that they are unwittingly no more than Gaia's disease. The challenge this time is not to protect humans against microbes, but to protect Gaia against those microbes called humans. Just as bacteria ran the Earth for two billion years, Lovelock told me, and ran it very well, keeping it stabilized, we are now running the Earth. We are stumbling a bit, but the future of the Earth depends on us as much as it depended on the bacteria. 
Now, you're going to see this afternoon, uh, as part of the panel, uh, a series of, um, uh, of short video clips. Uh, and it's interesting also because Lovelock is an independent scientist. He's an environmentalist, an inventor, an author, a researcher. And uh, it's part of a series of interviews I've been doing with scientists, you know, asking them about their kind of invention or epiphany. It started all in Switzerland when I grew up. I became friendly with Albert Hoffmann, who, you know, discovered LSD. And he once told me so beautifully about the day he discovered LSD. And so I thought it would be great to ask other scientists about, you know, such moments of, of revelation. And I went to see Lovelock. And he not only credited Lee Margulis, he also credited his neighbor, William Golding, who is, of course, the, you know, famous English novelist. And uh, it was actually William Golding who gave him the idea. And he talked a lot about interdisciplinarity and the idea that we can only address big questions such as uh, uh, environmental questions if we go beyond the fear of pooling knowledge. You know, if you bring, if you break down the silos, which is of course um, what is the idea also of the forum of uh, Terme, you know, today in Berlin and many of the previous forum, and that's also the idea of um, what we do at the Serpentine. And I have a few images which we maybe can see here. I mean, I brought some images of the pavilion. Uh, you saw earlier today Sumaya from Counterspace. This is basically going to be uh, the pavilion we develop over two years uh, with mainly, you know, lots of different mushroom bricks and fully sustainable materials. And it's for the first time that the pavilion is not only happening in Kensington Gardens, but it's going to happen in many neighborhoods in London, uh, often with a migratory background, and there's going to be collaborations, exchange, and also infrastructural support for these neighborhoods and for, you know, our practitioners in these neighborhoods. So really, it is about uh, a conversation. And uh, uh, in this pavilion will also happen a lot of conversations and, and debates, because the pavilion is for us also a pretext to have conversations. And then we can see on the next slide, this is a detail, the marathons, right? So we basically um, started to uh, do a format called the marathons. Uh, and that means we bring together maybe 50, 60 speakers uh, digitally or in person to discuss a theme from all different angles. And so uh, one theme was extinction, and that is something which is particularly relevant for today's session because it's actually the beginning really, thanks to Gustav Metzger, uh, the, the English-German artist who passed away a few years ago. He basically, a uh, uh, very visionary figure of the avant-garde in the UK, who uh, with the Autodestruction Symposium, uh, you know, wrote an art history of the 60s, but very soon started to realize that we need to fight the looming extinction. And since the 70s, 80s, was really working very intensely on that on that theme because he said it's not only an extinction of species, it's an extinction of cultural phenomena, of languages. Uh, and he basically was a very close friend of the Serpentine and of, of all of us, uh, of myself, of all the curators, and would very often just come to our office and remind us that we have to fight extinction. So in a way, you'll hear more about that from Lucia Pietro Justi, uh, our curator at the Serpentine of Ecology and the founder at the Serpentine of the General Ecology Project, because of course, uh, all of that, what we are doing with ecology in such a sustained way, would not have happened without Gustav. He laid the fundament for that in our institution. And whenever we did a project, you know, the next morning he stood in our office and he said, don't think that you've now done it. It has just begun. You know, you need to do more on, on that theme. And uh, you can see a few more images here. Is a, you know, a post of the Extinction Marathon. We did a work marathon here, the bed-in by the Beatrix Colomino, re revisiting the Yoko Ono bed-in. Um, uh, we, we talked there, you know, about the future of work uh, and uh, the notion of particularly relevant now during this crisis, this uh, COVID crisis, the question of uh, general basic income. And we collaborated with uh, the late Bernard Stiegler, who um, actually very sadly passed away this summer. So I want to somehow dedicate this short speech, you know, to his, uh, to his memory. Uh, and Bernard, Bernard Stiegler, uh, said actually that it's about uh, not a general basic income, but a conditional basic income. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the whole thing led also to a letter related to uh, the environment, to Gutierrez, and uh, you can see all of that on our website, there is an archive. Then we have the Miracle Marathon, where we had 50 speakers exploring miracle uh, for the 21st century. Here, Genesis P. Orich, and we have, I think, one more slide. 
Uh, it all began with the interview marathon we did with Rem Kohlhaas, where we interviewed 72, you know, Londoners, uh, trying to somehow, it connects to the panel before, really, sort of uh, connecting to what is the future of the city. So big themes being addressed from all different angles uh, in a very interdisciplinary way. And of course, the whole Gaia theory is a deeply interdisciplinary field. It would never have been, uh, you know, even um, uh, discussed without a bringing together of so many disciplines. Both Margulis and Lovelock are truly interdisciplinary figures. Uh, and uh, Lovelock also said that actually a philosopher and an astronomer played a crucial role. Carl Sagan, you know, at the Jet Propulsion Lab, and the philosopher Diane Hitchcock. She, for him, uh, was very important, you know, at the moment when he basically, um, he was reasoning that oxygen comes from plants and methane comes from bacteria, both living things, and then through that suddenly understood that the Earth must be regulating its atmosphere. So when he actually started to discuss this, you know, in this very interdisciplinary forum at the NASA, Sagan, the astronomer's response was, Jim, this is nonsense. You know, he says it was wrong, so similar to Margulis, you know, the idea was rejected. I'm sure we'll hear more from you about the extent to which Margulis faced that, you know, during her lifetime. Uh, and uh, uh, he said it's wrong because we cannot think that the Earth can regulate itself because astronomical objects don't do that. But then Sagan suddenly changed his mind. He said, hold on a minute, there is one thing that's been puzzling us astronomers, and that's the cool sun problem. At the Earth's birth, the sun was 30% cooler than it's now, so why aren't we boiling? And so that is a really important beginning point, you know, of this epiphany, because he brought Lovelock to the realization that if the animal and the plant life regulate the CO2, they can control the temperature. And that was really when Gaia entered the building. While subject to criticism that it's a new age idea, uh, basically the, uh, you know, the, the, the scientists who, besides Lovelock, of course, drove this idea, was as discussed, you know, Lim Margulis. And Lovelock was trained from the medical side, uh, and, and in that sense needed again Margulis, you know. Uh, so you will see a lot of different disciplines need to collaborate uh, so that such an idea, you know, can can be born, and, 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 and Lovelock, uh, in that sense, was part of a chain, you know, uh, 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 a very horizontal chain of many collaborators. Margulis, certainly the most important, uh, uh, but also Diane Hitchcock, also Carl Sagan, who need to be credited. So we are very delighted today to have a panel uh, which Mikolai Gadot, uh, and which I will help him to moderate, which we look at uh, uh, Gaia as uh, an idea for the 21st century, uh, and I think we're now going to start with our first speaker. Our first speaker would be then um, uh, the great James Lovelock, so we would like to have his original voice um, uh, for two minutes uh, to listen to how the theory of Gaia, the Gaia hypothesis, was born in the first place. And uh, we will see during this conversation that, uh, that actually the view of artists on the, on, the, on the world is exactly this kind of horizontal, interdisciplinary view that connects so many dots and connects also the things that we cannot express yet, cannot see yet, and cannot yet understand, but they are still in the work. And this is exactly the approach that, uh, that we see in, in, in this Gaia Hypothesis introduction? Uh, there was a, a number of small offices yeah. at the Jet Propulsion Labs in the early phases. This was 1965 in September. So this year will be 50 years from the inception of the idea. And I was in the room with a, a, a a, a lady philosopher called Diane Hitchcock. Yeah. She was one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. Um, extraordinary. Um, to give you an idea how good she was, she'd done no science at all, but she was employed by NASA to look at the logical consistency yeah. of the experiments that were being sent to Mars to see wow. if they were wasting money. And it was a very good thing. And she went round and talked to everybody, and of course she came and talked to me. And she very much liked the megentropy type of yeah. experiment. She thought that was a practical, sensible way of going about it. But anyway, that's beside the point. I was sitting in this room with her and with Carl Sagan. You've heard of him, the yeah. astronomer. And because I shared the office with, that, with yeah. Carl 
That was our office there. And we talked a lot whenever I got a chance. And then in March is another astronomer, Lewis Kaplan, and in his arms were sheets of paper. And we said, well, what's all that? He said, the complete analysis of the Martian and the Venus atmosphere. And it's been acquired from a little telescope at the Pic de Midi in France. Wow. Uh, and it, using an instrument designed by a friend of mine, Peter Felgett, yeah. a Fourier transform uh, spectrometer. And so we all said, well, what, what, what is the atmosphere? And he said, it's quite simple. It's nearly all carbon dioxide. It's just mere traces of other things. So I knew instantly there's almost certainly no life on either of those two planets. And that suddenly made me think, well, what about the Earth? How has it got so different an atmosphere from its two sister yeah. planets? And then it came into my mind, just a, a flash of enlightenment, I call it, that, well, it must be regulating the atmosphere. Yeah. And then I thought, it almost instantly again, but what, where do the gases come from? Well, we knew that oxygen comes from the plants, and methane, which it reacts with, com comes from the bacteria. Well, those are two living things. Yeah. Um, and Carl Sagan's remark at first was, oh, Jim, it's nonsense to think that the Earth can regulate itself. I mean, astronomical objects don't do that. He lost his message. Yeah, but then he said, but hold it a minute. He said, there's one thing that's puzzled us astronomers, and that is the cool sun problem. Yeah. Well, at its birth, the sun was 30% cooler, or rather, the Earth's birth, 30% cooler than it is yeah. now. So well, why aren't we boiling? Uh, uh, but it seems to have kept the same temperature all throughout history. So more, that was, more or less. That it wobbled a little bit. And that went into your direction of well, the Well, instantly, I thought, oh, heavens. It, yeah. it, if that's true, then all the biota have to do is to regulate the CO2. Yeah. And they can control the temperature. Yeah. And that's what they've been doing. And that's, that's when God just came. That was it. Thank you very much. So... Um, this is uh, a moment of epiphany that, that, that was recreated here through, through his speech, but also a moment of complexity and the difference between a design that is life and a design that is cutting through life and living basically death behind. And uh, I, I would just ask the first question to Thomas Saraceno that is working with life, working with living organisms, working with an architecture that is created through spiders, for example. And uh, the question is just jumping into the water, uh, into the cold water. Uh, can we learn from spiders how to create an environment? Yes, I think so. Um, I have been coming here, I thought like uh, what it might be to think about the terms for spiders, which temperature of the water might like it, right? <laughs> well, actually, there are some spiders who live under the water uh, in a bubble of air, and they just go down, it's kind of a diving bell, they go, they go up to the, to the surface, uh, they don't have length like, a, um, uh, like a fishes, they really need to, 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 to go up, uh, pick up a little bit of air, then bring it down, and then all the time they kind of uh, um, augment or refresh the air, uh, um, um, the air bubble under the water. This means in, in evolutionary terms they didn't make it, uh, 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 let's say, to the, to the atmosphere, uh, as, as, as we might think. Now, w w one thing that always for me is struggling, because when we kind of keep thinking is uh, about a spider and, and, and I'm kind of as a provocation always kind of try to kind of revise the taxonomy of how um, you know we separate uh, uh, the different and we have to review the name kingdom also and in this case we, we kind of have a new coupling because usually it's a spider and then there's a spider web and the way we, how we name it is spider slash web to that extent, you know, to try to think about, uh, you know, the embody or extended cognition that uh, maybe resonate with Maturan and Varela uh, in, in the extent of, of and, and when we think about architecture, maybe uh, not um, only on the, let's say, terrestrial web, but the, the cosmic web also. Uh, somehow this, this, this separation, not this obsession, somehow to look at the animal without the context where it lives, right? And this, I mean, in, in that extent, I think so, uh, uh, 
you know, hopefully he could, uh, he could help us, uh, you know, the, the web uh, to, to rethink, uh, you know, this uh, um, social political kind of uh, program on trying to, to think about uh, the way how we relate with, uh, with, uh, with certain animals, right? And then and the idea of domestication and, 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 and that spider somehow, um, they live with us, no? Or, or, or rather opposite, I will say, we live with the spider, no? When we think a little bit about uh, how long they have been on the planet, uh, they have been and the one who we've wept since 380 million years on this planet Earth. While humans, uh, as Mancuso might said also, hopefully he'll come up, uh, have lived on this planet only 310,000 years. This means a third of a million, uh, while spider 380 million. Now, biologists said that usually you have to to know uh, uh, to live in a place you might know you might have lived at least two million years. I mean, if you compare now humans, uh, we are only on 310,000. There's a long way yet to go. I mean, when we think about, you know, it's a little bit what maybe is, um, Boaventura drive from the indigenous culture, the global south, you know, is like a, um, 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 it's this idea of uh, um, 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 we have to learn uh, to live with them to a certain extent, right? And try to, as, as we said, change the, our habit and not change the climate. Now, w when it comes just only to pick up a little bit, uh, and I don't want to get it so long, but w w when Hans was, was talking uh, about uh, James and, and, and the disruption of humans, um, uh, I think so we have to be very careful of the inequalities that we are living today in the world. And this, I mean, they are not all humans uh, equally access uh, on the possibility to think about the Anthropocene, which I think is the better term, is the capital sin, right? And this, I mean, there is a huge inequality in relationship about uh, thinking as human as a or destructive or a guardian uh, of a certain possibility to co-inhabit this planet. As much as, you know, uh, the, the more uh, biodiversity on this planet Earth today, you find it where also human inhabit. Has the possibility, you know, is the equatorial forest, and it is, they, they live humans, but a certain uh, part of humanity, which I think so, uh, uh, is really well entangled with other form of lives. Has been when we said like, and, this, and they're not disrupting the form of lives, what maybe uh, uh, we, 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 we we think we could, we could uh, survive together with other species. And it's been, you know, th there is this huge uh, uh, moment that we have to be, uh, I think so, uh, together on try to, to think about is 1% uh, or the 30%, some said, uh, in relationship of the um, carbon emission that we are releasing up there and how we, this pandemic maybe hopefully will help us to live together, right? Uh, remember the, the spiders live in your house, or rather, we live in the house of the spiders, right? It's always, we have to make this exercise or change the perspective we, with whom we live, uh, right? And, and, and share the houses. Uh, and to that extent, there is a huge arachnophobia. We are phobic about certain things which bring a lot of destruction, right? Uh, up to 6.2% of all the population of planet Earth are phobics of spiders. And these drive a lot of, um, um, you know, fears. And that fears drive extinction uh, because, um, because there is no reason, basically, of being afraid of spiders. They, you know, they, they very, very, very rarely kill you. But there is a whole culture uh, that is built around that, uh, that it make a business, like the fake news, that somebody earned money to, to, to Tell fake news, and it's and it's fake that the spiders will kill you, and there is any phobia. There is no any reason, but there's a business, there is a culture. This mean, 30% of people who go to see Spider-Man, which I think so, we should maybe find a more gender equal relation with the spiders. Also. The capacity, they, they they change their habits, and they're more much less keen to become arachnophobic. This mean, you know, but but mostly the whole culture around uh, spiders is about. Uh, Terror movies, horror that we're gonna eat and conquer the earth, and so that. This I mean, you know, is is a lot with the narrative. No, I, I went too far off. Oh, you want to hear one more thing, and then I finish my thing. I don't know. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Then then I, then I will pass by the microphone to. Uh, there are two persons here. We work. He's Lars and Sarah, and there is a very beautiful uh, thing uh, that I've been working with Peter Yeager. He's a man who have named 400 spiders.
right? And there's like big troubles about naming. This is I'm proposing to revision all the taxonomy of how spiders have been named and try to see how names somehow change a lot to our capacity of survival. No, this means Sarah Kissner. Could you read that? He's really like only sentence only. Thank you. So this is a text from Peter Yeager, sent to Tomas. It's just a short reflection on names and how to rethink these names in history. So considering the names of stars, streets, sports teams, and even insects, we have the opportunity to rethink the reverberations of colonial histories. Take, for example, the beetle, and excuse me, my Latin is not so good, but Anopelanthus hitleri. It's a bl uh, blind brownish beetle found in caves in Slovenia, and in 1937 was named after Adolf Hitler, for whom the scientist that found this beetle had a great admiration. Today, the beetle is a much sought after is much sought after in neo-Nazi circles. It goes for around a thousand euros per beetle, and has even been stolen from several museum collections. Zoologically, this name and others with similar histories are valid. Yet, we should carefully consider their future use. Shall we use them as examples to inform young generations about the misconduct of previous times? Shall we change the names, and if so, how can we avoid to make the same mistake in the future? It is clear that actions of formal colonial powers were not in congruence with human rights and should be viewed critically. But this means this bill, because God name that name, now is driving to extinction because all the neo Nazi want to get that bill. And this means it's stolen in a museum. This means it's this kind of strange paradox, right? Of, of thinking how a name somehow also can. Uh, Nomen is omen. Uh, ich meine, um, Maturana and Varela, they published, I think it was uh, 79, uh, the radical discourse of constructivism, where they basically claimed that all our world is our construction. Yeah? And they proved it with means of, uh, with the research of Hans Otto Peitgen in mathematics and uh, stochastics, which is extremely interesting to read. Now we actually the, the prophecy was fulfilled. We live in a world that is constructed by us, named by us, and divided by us. And this kind of division is actually becoming reality. And it's quite interesting that you mention. But the, the us is not. It, 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 we have to be careful with the us. Us, we, it, you cannot put humans all in the same bag. No, that, absolutely that's it, not. Really, we have to be very careful. But for sure, the spiders are not naming themselves. This is. This is, uh, and this is the interesting point, because if you put yourself into this position of a spider, how a spider would name himself or herself, or is a spider phobic, for example? That's an interesting question, because we are phobic not only against spiders, but we are phobic uh, against ourselves. So, as you may know already, 45% of our human cells uh, 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 of our cells in our body are non-human cells. It's bacterial elements, it's bacterial uh, life and organism that is a part of our life and a part of our, of our existence. And we are phobic against this bacteria. It's very interesting when our company uh, in March faced with the lockdowns of COVID uh, created a health culture cluster to really research how we can make our facilities more, more hygienic, you know, more safe. Uh, I called Professor Axel Kramer, the founder of the German Association of Hygienics in Hospitals, the founding president. And I asked him, how can we get rid of all this virus and bacteria? And his answer was, this is the wrong question. We need more bacteria. We need more viruses because only then we can sustain. And this is exactly the question of phobia and this is the question of division then when we look into nature, it's so complex, that it's so undivided, that uh, it sustains itself in a complexity that is necessary and that we probably have lost through our own design. And that would lead me immediately to Francis Curie, uh, Hans Ulrich. But, but before that, I have uh, one more question to, to Thomas, because actually it's kind of interesting, you know, the, the idea that rather than to be phobic of spiders, you, you told me the other day we should actually listen to them. And um, I had a very unusual phone call a few months ago from Thomas when you asked me to send you some questions. And I didn't get it in the first place because I thought you wanted me to send you questions for you. But that, that wasn't the idea. The idea was, I understood only in the second when I read it again, the email, you wanted me to send questions for spiders. So uh, the idea of interviewing spiders. 
uh, and you went on a journey and uh, interviewed these spiders with questions from several people. So the spiders become a form of oracle. Can, can you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, well, there is gum uh, is a form of spider divination that is practiced. is a, is a millenary, have a very old uh, tradition. But uh, now, in, in, the, in the very north of Cameroon, with, almost with the border with Nigeria, uh, they, they keep practicing uh, very strongly. And then and they have an agency which is very, very strong also in the sense of uh, uh, if the spider, let's say, uh, um, it's kind of helped to organize the village, uh, even the juridical system. In the case that if the spider, uh, seven spiders ask, answer in a consecutive way that somebody has been guilt of something, this person will go to jail. I mean, I kind of, this kind of reverse uh, uh, political agency that somehow in the mass extinction and with, with, uh, with what we are facing, I think so what, what Hans said and, and Gustav Metzer, to, somehow give the agency to the spider that they are there, the, the court and the, and the judge that somehow can, can make us, uh, some of us guilty to that extent. But I don't know, you got, got, got lost. Uh, well, the good news, this means Hans sent a question and many other, uh, Vincius the Press also sent other question. Emma, I don't know if she's here, Emma, Ender, please. Emma, Emma, no. Uh, and I think so, Emma asked uh, who will be the next president of the United States. And I have a very good news. And then we asked this to the spider, will be the current president or will be another? And the spider said for two times, the, the current president will not be reelected. This means at least uh, oracle wise, uh, from uh, Cameroon, uh, we, we got good news, at least from that extent. But but was a very, I mean, it was very, very difficult because uh, um, when, when we start to work there and we, with the diviner, you cannot ask uh, not a real question. They don't have this idea of fiction. It should be something that really uh, is, uh, it, it's, it affects somehow the way of how we could live. But, uh, and this means was some, somehow, uh, and there is a, a beautiful uh, division, I don't know, Hans. He'd answer um, that question. And it's through the vibration. This means I brought today also here, because you cannot talk uh, human language uh, to spider, right? And this, means this is a, it's a tuning fork, usually have a frequency of 310, 340. And this means this is simulate usually the frequency of vibration of crickets, mosquitoes. And this means when, when, you, when you put like this and you put it next to a web, the spider usually will always call. Come right, and it's been uh, you know we have to tap into this different umwelt and try to really uh, uh, maybe entangle other languages. This mean uh, the diviner what it does when we, when we give him the question, he have a, a stone and, and and he produce old vibration that somehow go to the earth, and the spider uh, it seems uh, is able to engage in in that uh, uh, non-human language. Thank you, Thomas. And I think that could indeed not be a better transition, as uh, Nicolas said to. Francis Carré, because um, of course the idea of architecture as an ecosystem, um, Gaia, the idea actually of uh, uh, a, a worldview that stresses networking, co-evolution, is something we could see in your work when we built the Serpentine Pavilion. So it would be great to hear a little bit from you about that. And of course Francis Carré needs no introduction in Berlin, is an award-winning leading architect um, who is based in Berlin and uh, many of his projects actually happen all over the world, but there is also a very strong presence in Burkina Faso. And we met um, many, many years ago, actually, thanks to Christoph Schlingensief, who I think passed away exactly 10 years ago from now, it's already 10 years, uh, because of course Christoph invited uh, Francis to build the opera village in uh, um, in Burkina Faso, and that ties in a lot with the previous panel about the Gesamtkunstwerk, in a way. Okay, hi. I, I think I made a mistake to join this panel, but not a mis in mistake. Um, you will see I'm not a scientist, but I have to say something today. So it's a great, great pleasure to be here and to listen to him. You know, if you, you are connected to me, and you will often see if, uh, you know, if something is panicking, if there is a bee going to your beer, to your wine, to your sweet stuff, you will see me saying, don't touch it. Why are you panicking? Yeah. This insect has no mother, no father. 
Why are you touching it? Why do you want to kill it? So, you know, you instinctively, I will say this. People are always looking to me like, okay, he's joking again. Um, you have to, to know that for me, it's a great pleasure because listening and the theory of Gaia and move, uh, uh, trees and plants that are moving, uh, for me, it's great that the Western world start to think about things like that, you know? If I go and I learn to, uh, to Wagadugu and I sh just take a, a bus or a car to my village, then I start to see pregnant trees. They're getting cared by the people, by the women, because of a heavy pregnancy. If a couple of years ago I have been talking about that, you will say it's a charlatan. So to my people, I always laugh and say, I want to be very known and respected in the world and the Western world, then I can talk about the irrational world that is the real world, you know. So I'm still working hard to just get there, and then one day I will start to talk about it. You're going to run the way. <laughs> your scientists are still at the beginning, which is great, and I love your work, really. And, yeah. Okay, good. Now to my own work. It's not that sensational is born out of sheer, sheer necessity. And to doing this work, it has allowed me to meet great people, visionary, and one of the, those uh, visionary is Christoph Schlingensief, that we really know very well. If I'm referring to him, um, I would just always think about uh, social plastic. If you want to create structure that people feel uh, taking ownership of it, feel it is our, then you have to get everyone be involved. And again, through Christoph, I have discovered uh, um, boy's work, you know. Uh, so Christoph was always talking about social plastic and say, okay, social plastic. Should I Google, should I call someone? But I had no time to look because he was like demanding, always, always, always. And uh, what I know from that, it's, you know, we're not isolated and a professional should put effort to get any professional be involved. Today we heard the word about interdisciplinary working. Um, naively, naively, I tried to do that. So I would ask my people, I would ask everyone even, sometime in the office, and then those that don't know me, we say, but he knows why he's asking. But it's just, if you ask questions, you get people be involved. And I tell you, you're gonna learn a lot. And that is the basement of my work and somehow, you know. And so, okay, today we have crisis of people moving to the West. No one is really asking the reason why, you know. So they're worried about how to bring them. And if I bring them in my country, I'm going to lose the next elections. Because this is what it's about. You're not winning elections if you give home to these people. What I'm, as a planner, would say, like, if you keep dealing the same way we do with nature, you're destroying home of people. And so these people would have to move. And I think that is a big concern. That's why I think we have to have a holistic approach to things. And I'm so grateful that I was able to do that. Um, we hesitated a lot to join you guys because I was saying you will sit again with no preparation. You haven't had the chance to talk to, talk to your friend uh, Hans or to call Nikolai and say, hey guys, what do you want me to say? Do you want me to show pictures? Um, happily, in my case, with the corona and every corona is also part of it. And I, I like this way to, to say we need more bacteria. It's like, uh, it's something that we gonna, it's a wake up call that I think, and we have to consider life as a holistic thing and the way we build as something that is fundamental to our survival. Community is part of it. Natural resources are a deep part of it. If you are in a place where you have a lot of clay, use it. If you're in a place where you have wood, use it. And we had the chance to use wood in a colorful way. Um, I remember uh, when uh, I was uh, uh, meeting uh, uh, Elton John, he just told me uh, in face of my daughter, this is by far the best pavilion I have seen. And my daughter was like, ooh, <laughs> you know? And so it's about checking and looking and seeing how I can use things. If I am in Montana, I found a dead forest. 
where should I ask for wood from somewhere because America is powerful, it can't go and take the material. I said, no, let's take a dead forest and create a pavilion. And I haven't had the chance yet to show you this pavilion, Hans. You will be surprised what it is, um, how you can take this material, uh, grabs by the way, and explain to the cowboy, guys, you have power, but let's talk to the nature. Let awake a dead forest and give us a new life. And so this is the way I'm doing things. And so I'm very grateful. I'm looking forward to do more. Yeah. But it's beautiful. Uh, thank you so much for this. And indeed, you are on the on the right panel because uh, we, both Mikola and I, really thought it's so relevant. You know, in terms of also this idea of nature. And Tadao Ando said, "We borrow from nature the space on which we build." And I always remember when we invited you to design the Serpentine Pavilion, um, the first story you really told us was the, the story of, of a tree. And uh, it was very much about uh, a conversation, really, with a tree, uh, the center of this pavilion. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about, you know, um, your thoughts on Tadao Ando's quote, right, to borrow from nature the space we built, but also, um, but also in a way for the pavilion that conversation with the tree, I thought, was super, super fascinating. Yeah. No, I mean, um, the, the funny things uh, that we, the funny thing that we uh, ignore is the fact that a tree is the, is the very first uh, shelter that you have. Very primitive and very important one. And everywhere where you are, you will see a tree. And my, my goal was to consider the tree as a gathering space and then I wanted to just bring in this rich uh, country and city, London, to bring uh, a tree from my village in the middle of the Kensington Garden to create a, a, a tree. And uh, I mean, uh, we did the sketches. My team was like a little bit laughing. Uh, normally, I was expecting they will say, Francis, you fail. And then I got a call when Hans started to talk about it. I said, wow, OK. We have to go, guys, we have to go to London and build a, a big baobab in the center of London. And it, it's, 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 it's how it are. But I wanted the tree to be connected to water, the essential element. That's why we arrange our structure the way that it can collect water. Uh, so in, in terms of thinking, uh, to grow, you need water. You need natural resources. We need it. And hence, what you don't know, the idea of tree is still growing. Now I am building a huge parliament house. It's bigger than the German Reichstag building. It's a big tree, really with a trunk uh, in, uh, in, in, in Benin. The office has been working during Corona time to make this tree happen. It was a, a, a competition. And I just told them, we African, we have to go back under the Palava tree and sit and talk. Normally, if you, you, you show off with an idea like this in Africa, they will kick you out. Because we want to copy your way of life, the way people build here. Uh, but we don't know why people build like they do here, you know. I grew up watching termites, you know. They will use clay and build giant towers. And then the rain will come. It will not destroy it. And it's well ventilated. Uh, why we don't think that way? Go and sit under the big tree and Okay, they didn't kick me out. So we're building. So, yeah, I love trees. Yeah, yeah. So I keep much. sleeping under trees. The first time when I got my student from Berlin to my village, um, they will sleep inside the compound. And I was sleeping outside. So then in the middle of night, under the, a tree. In the middle of the night, I heard some noises, and I wake up. And they came to say, oh, there is a big crocodile in the village. So I said, oh, nice. <laughs> I put my pillow and I keep sleeping. And some came later panic, why he's not running away? But I was already sleeping very deep. And the next day, my student just arrived and said, Francis, you don't fear a crocodile. I said, oh, OK, it's my relative. No? So, and then. You will be surprised. A couple of days later, we went to a market. <laughs> and then there, people just told me, Nabiga, Nabiga means prince. We found your crocodile. Your crocodile is here. It's like from the village. Everyone knows there was a crocodile in my village. 
and you see how people are really connected and then you should not fear you should not create paranoia you know and so is life under a big tree so tree brings us thank you so much i mean this is so beautiful it's like magic it's uh, you talk like um uh, Charmaine, actually, and um, and probably art and architecture should uh, play this role, should also deal with the invisible, with the emotional, and uh, with what we cannot yet grasp. So uh, the tree story brings me to Stefano Mancuso. Stefano Mancuso, that is the science test that you were referring to, that is the science test that tries to grasp the the um, magic and to prove it. And he proved that trees are intelligent. He proved that trees are communicating with each other. Uh, he, he is obviously the, the person that inspired me personally and many of us uh, to think into this direction. He was the one that, that introduced me to James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis. Um, then I learned that Hans Ulrich was already there many years before, and uh, I have to say, uh, Stefano couldn't be here today because he is meeting tomorrow morning with Pope Francis to discuss exactly these topics, because the uh, preservation of natural resources um, and the empathy that we have to develop again uh, uh, towards nature, this is also now becoming the topic of, of uh, the Pope and the Catholic Church. and. Um, uh, Having listened to how we um, reconnect to nature, how we can uh, instead of building, because building means actually destroying. Yeah, if you really think about it, building means to take something that was alive and to destroy it, and then to build out something out of it. And and when we want to follow the the title of this talk, growing Gaia, it means that we not only need to preserve nature, not to destroy it, but probably we need to regrow it, 